Hello, my name is Ron George and I'm a rheumatology fellow at Duke University. This talk will briefly cover polymyositis and inclusion body myositis. Our objectives for this topic are to review these two inflammatory myopathies and talk about the clinical features of each as well as how to go about diagnosing them. They are distinct disease processes and I want to highlight the differences and similarities. Finally, we will cover treatment options. So let's get started. I'll start with who gets a myopathy, move on to clinical features and characteristic physical exam findings. Testing for myopathies is crucial to the diagnosis, so I will cover the buzzwords in an EMG and pathology report. Understanding how these diseases work may help you diagnose and treat them, so we will cover the pathophysiology and conclude with treatment modalities. Polymyositis and inclusion body myositis are both rare diseases. They're often lumped in with dermatomyositis due to similarities in presentation but this is a distinct process and has become to be thought of as a separate entity and is covered in another lecture. I will talk about it some, but mostly focus on PM and IBM. Both PM and IBM are inflammatory processes that often occur in the setting of another autoimmune disease, such as SLE or scleroderma. They can occur by themselves, of course, but look for overlap between the connective tissue diseases. PM can be seen as part of an entity called the antisynthetase syndrome, and key antibodies will help with diagnosis and prognosis. Severe cases of inflammatory myopathy, including polymyositis, dermatomyositis, or inclusion body myositis, present with the patient unable to lift his head from a pillow and unable to sit up assisted. The weakness begins insidiously and progresses slowly over three to six months. Due to the systemic nature of the inflammation and in inflammatory myopathies, patients may have a low albumin leading to edema, which is worsened by the loss of skeletal muscle tone. In severe cases, patients may lose the ability to swallow due to pharyngeal muscle weakness. Preceding the inability to swallow, patients often complain of dysphagia. Family members may notice a raspy or hoarse character to the patient's voice. The loss of pharyngeal muscle tone increases the risk of aspiration of pneumonia, and involvement of the respiratory musculature can lead to the sensation of dyspnea. Patient presentation can vary, but commonly we see patients who have trouble going upstairs or getting up out of a chair. Their symptoms are usually with minimal pain. It may be noted that patient weakness is out of proportion to their pain. The weakness is primarily proximal, affecting the hip flexors and girdle musculature of the lower extremities, as well as shoulder and neck musculature of the upper extremity. In both PM and IBM, the initial presentation is generally bilateral and symmetric. IBM, however, can progress to involve distal muscle groups and may be asymmetric on presentation. The most common manifestations outside of muscle weakness or PM or IBM is in the lungs. Systemic manifestation may also occur with fever, myalgia, and arthritis. Several autoantibodies are associated with the inflammatory myopathies. The anti jo one antibody in particular is associated with interstitial lung disease. anti jo one is an anti-synthetase antibody and one of many that are seen with PM and IBM. When lungs are involved in an inflammatory myopathy, Pulmonary function testing reveals a restrictive lung disease pattern. High-resolution CT scanning may reveal honeycombing or a ground glass appearance. Honeycombing is often due to scar or fibrosis and thus less amenable to treatment. The appearance of ground glass type opacity such as alveolitis may improve with immunosuppressant therapy. Once your clinical suspicion is high enough to consider an inflammatory myositis, certain lab tests can help you confirm it. Muscle damage releases creatinine kinase or creatinine phosphokinase depending on the laboratory institution, but elevations in aldolase can also be seen. Both can be elevated, but at times only one of the two may rise with inflammation. In long-standing disease, you may not see the elevation due to loss of muscle mass. As in most rheumatologic diseases, the ESR and CRP are elevated. Muscle is also a source for AST and ALT that should be not confused with hepatic injury in the setting of a normal alkaline phosphatase bilirubin, or GGT. Additionally, a nonspecific elevation in LDH is common. Additional testing should be ordered to confirm your diagnosis. The gold standard is an EMG, and up to 90% of patients with active myositis will have an abnormal study. Recently, MRI has become a common tool that can diagnose, but also, in conjunction with EMG, identify a site for biopsy. On MRI, the T1 weighted image and STIR indicate inflammation which is bright or hyperintense. Finally, biopsy should be done of an affected muscle group. The biopsy becomes vital in distinguishing polymyositis, dermatomyositis, and inclusion body myositis 
from each other. Here we have a nice example of polymyositis in that each muscle fiber is being surrounded by inflammatory cells, as indicated by the large arrows. You can also see a patchy distribution. Affected fibers begin to shrink and darken with macrophages inside the fiber, as can be seen at the top near the small arrow above. To summarize and bring together the differences and similarities between the inflammatory myopathies, I came up with this slide. First is polymyositis with a patchy distribution of inflammatory cells surrounding the fascicles that is mostly a T-cell population acting directly on the muscle fascicles. Dermatomyositis is predominantly B-cells and components of the complement cascade whose activation and aggregation result in vessel thrombosis which depletes blood flow to the muscle fascicles. In biopsies you can see that the muscle fibers necrotize in a vascular distribution as the blood flow is cut off due to endothelial cell hyperplasia of the blood vessel supplying the area. Inclusion biomyositis is similar or pathologically to polymyositis and is T-cell predominant. The exact role and how damage occurs is under study, but the presence of rimmed vacuoles is diagnostic of inclusion body myositis. These rimmed vacuoles can be seen by light microscopy, but often EM study is necessary to make this diagnosis. Treatment of PM and IBM is based on severity. In acute cases, IV glucocorticoids are the mainstay of treatment followed by an immunosuppressive agent. Poor prognostic factors play a role in how aggressively one should treat a patient, and they include delayed diagnosis, severe disease at onset, cancer-associated myositis, polymyositis compared to dermatomyositis, significant cardiac or pulmonary involvement, presence of antisynthetase antibodies, or anti-SRP antibodies. IV cyclophosphide is often used in cases that involve the lung or antisynthetase syndrome. In ambulatory patients, methotrexate and azathioprine may be used. Often, IVIG is helpful to provide prompt relief of symptoms until oral therapy has time to reach peak effect. These patients are often sick, and a rheumatology consult early in the disease process can aid in early treatment. Finally, physical therapy and occupational therapy are essential for patients to regain lost muscle function and tone. In summary, polymyositis and inclusion body myositis are inflammatory, immune-mediated myopathies. Painless proximal muscle weakness is a hallmark of the disease. Elevations in CK, AST, ALT, LDH, ESR, and CRP are common. Treatment begins with corticosteroids and moves to stronger immunosuppressants. The lung is the most common extramuscular organ affected. Thank you.